two, three. Good morning, church. Thank you for joining us this morning. I don't know what maybe your weeks have looked like, but um, God is on the throne. Jesus is the King of kings, Lord of lords. He reigns in the heavens. He's the ruler of our lives. All our glory, all of our praise goes to him. So let's shout song of praise this morning within all the songs we sing let's uh let's praise our king sing through every battle through every heart through every circumstance i believe that you are my fortress oh you are my portion Mercy in mind, Lord, you brought me back to life. You're the 
soul You give me grace and mercy I give you control Like a river Like a river of life In a dry land Like a flicker of sight To a blind man I saw the glory as light As it broke in God have mercy in my Oh, you brought me back to life You're the Lord of my life Shining in the dark You're the source of life Leading in my heart You're the living hope You're the risen Christ You restore my soul Oh, you brought me back to life to read our scripture this morning. Good morning, church. Today's scripture is from the book of Titus, chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. But... When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. That is the living word of God. Thank you, church. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, Will.
Hollywood Community Church family. I'm so glad that you have decided to worship with us today. If you are participating in our worship service for the very first time, let me give you a warm welcome. I'm so glad that you are participating with us today. In the Facebook and in the YouTube description, you will find a connection card. Would you be kind enough to fill that out for us? We would love to have a record of your attendance with us today. If you're a regular attender, a part of our HCC family, we would love for you to fill out our online attendance form. Tell us that you're worshiping today. And not only that, but let us know who's worshiping with you. So let me take just a few moments and talk about what is on all of our minds and our hearts. When will we regather? Man, I get it. Like you, I long for us to come back together again as a church family. I want us to meet together. I want us to, to worship together. I want us to encourage one another. And quite frankly, as preachers, we're kind of tired of preaching to a camera. We want to see real faces and real bodies out there. I want you to know that Sundays are hard for me. Vicki would attest that, that my heart hurts on Sunday because I long to be with our church family. 
So I want you to know that we are moving in that direction. Pastor Jose has formed a coronavirus task force. They have already worked through the the guidelines given by the CDC and by the government, and we are making plans. We are working hard to meet together again. We do need to realize, though, that when we come back together, it might not look exactly the same. We're not going to be able to hug one another. We're going to be a little bit distanced from one another. We're probably going to have to wear face masks. That's okay, though. And please know that our auditorium is big enough that we can bring the majority of our church family together in our auditorium and make sure that everyone is safe, that you and your family are safe. So our tentative plans are for us to come together sometime in the early part of June. We don't have an exact date yet, but we hope to be able to share that with you in the near future. I would also add that our congregation is incredibly diverse. One of the strengths of our congregation is our diversity. And I know that all of us have a different opinion and a different desire. Some of you are ready to come back right now. And as a matter of fact, if we would have opened up our doors this morning, you would be here with us. Others of you are just a little bit more cautious. And I get that. You're not more spiritual by wanting to come back sooner, and you're not less spiritual by saying that you want to stay home and watch online for a period of time. We understand that as a church leadership, and we want to offer uh, a wonderful worship experience for you, whether you're here present in our building or whether you are worshiping online. I would ask you to do two things in the next few weeks. The first is this. Would you pray with us? I want you to be confident that our church leaders, our elders, and our pastors have been praying, and we are seeking God's direction. Psalm 37, 23 says, the steps of a good man are established by God. And we really want to hear from God. We want him to tell us when is the appropriate date for us to come back together and regather. Would you pray with us? And then secondly, let's make sure in the midst of our diversity, that we guard our unity. Psalm 133 mentions the fact that that God is present with his church whenever his church is unified. And so it's so important for us to maintain that diversity in the midst of, or maintain that unity in the midst of diversity. Let me read a verse in Philippians chapter one and verse 27. Paul says this, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. So whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. I also want you to know that in the midst of all of this separation, Hollywood Community Church has continued to be the church, and we've continued to fulfill our mission. I'm excited to share that we've ministered to more people in the last few weeks than before. Whether it's on our online experience or whether it's our food pantry, reaching out to our community, God has allowed us to continue to be the church. And you can rejoice in that. Next Sunday on May 31st at 5 p.m., we want to be able to offer you an online communion experience. And so once again, we'll meet at 5 p.m. We're going to meet on Zoom online. You will receive an email invitation from us. We do need your email address, though. If we don't have your email address, would you send that to us? You can send that to hccadmin at ourhcc.org, and we will make sure that you receive that invitation. Finally, I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear what God has done in your life and in the life of your family during this time. Maybe God has answered a prayer request. Maybe God has miraculously provided a need for you. I would love to hear that. Would you write me a personal note? My email address is brian at ourhcc.org. I'd love to hear from you. Please write me. So let me encourage you. Let's continue to be the church. We're going to be together very soon. Very soon we're together. But in the meantime, let's continue to be the church that God desires for us to be.
So let me encourage you this morning to be faithful in your giving. To be honest with you, the last few weeks our offering has been down. That's understandable. We haven't met together. But let me encourage you to be faithful in giving. If God has blessed you, which I'm sure that he has, would you give back to him? Maybe you haven't given during this time of pandemic. Can I encourage you to step up and do that? I would remind you that you can give in one of four ways. You can mail your gift in. You can give online. As a matter of fact, on the Facebook description and the YouTube description, there's a link that you can click on and you can give. You can give via text or you can give via app, whatever is convenient for you. Let me encourage you to be faithful, knowing that God is using your gifts to make an impact not only in our community, but around the world. Would you pray with me today? Father, thank you so much for your faithfulness during this difficult time. Thank you, Lord, that you provide for our needs. And Lord, thank you so much for your consistency in meeting our needs. And we also thank you for the privilege that you give us to give back to you. Help us to realize today that our giving is an act of worship. Whenever we give by faith, we, we worship you. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would help us as a church family to be faithful in our giving today. And Lord, help us to be faithful in using those gifts in a way that promotes the kingdom of God, Lord, promotes the gospel, and makes a difference in our community, in our world. We love you. Thank you so much for the faithfulness of your people. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. I need you soft in my heart and break me apart I need you to open my eyes and see that you're shaping my life and all I am I surrender me 
Extraordinary men and women went before us with unmatched resilience, enduring hardship, when called upon to defend and liberate. They said, yes. They found courage to rise with every son, loyalty toward their country, discipline for every command, even in the darkest hours, they said, yes. They cherished and fought for freedom, so those coming behind them were assured of it. And when the moment came for them to give it all, their futures never to be written, they said, yes. Today, we think upon their sacrifice and find our way to honor them saying yes to making the most of what they gave us and filling the earth with God's goodness. We thank them for their yes. They will never be forgotten. Memorial Day is an opportunity for us to remember those that have given their lives to protect the freedom of this country. And there's a verse that says this, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And this is truly what is descriptive of all of those fallen heroes that have given their life to protect our freedom, to protect our country, to perfect, to protect our our religious freedom to be able to come together as a church body and to worship Christ, that they have given their lives, given a sacrifice for that. But it's also a time for us to remember the families that they left behind and to remember them, to lift them up in prayer, to pray for them, that God would comfort them, that God's blessings would be upon them, that they have given a great sacrifice as well. So we're going to have just a moment of silence as we remember those that have fallen in the line of duty. Join with me in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the sacrifice of those fallen heroes. Father, we thank you that they were willing to give their lives to protect our country, to protect our family, to protect our friends, to protect our freedom, but Father, more importantly, to protect our religious freedom so that we can gather together as believers and worship you freely, Father God. And so we thank you for their sacrifice. But Father God, we lift up their families 
that as they mourn, as they grieve, Father God, that you would bring healing, that you would comfort their hearts, that you would bring them the blessings, Father God, that you would provide for all of their needs, Father, that you would continue to guide them. Father, we pray for the children, that you would become their father, that you would lead them, the Father, that they would know that they are loved by you. So Father, we thank you for their sacrifice. We are forever grateful for them. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So thank you for joining us online as we continue our series on the book of Romans. And we are excited to see God do a powerful work in our life and a powerful work in your lives. And we can't wait to see all the miraculous works that God has done during this difficult season that all of us are in right now. And the one thing for us that's important to remember is that God hasn't changed during this crisis. He is the same today, yesterday, and forever. He is the same God who can move the mountains. He is the same God who can part the sea. He's the same God who can quiet the storms of our life. He is the same God that can defy nature and walk on water. He is the same God who can provide manna for his people in the wilderness. He's the same God who can can feed the 5,000. So here's what we have to remember. God is working. He is always working. He is always moving in the hearts and minds of us, his people, and in the world. His spirit is equipping us. He's empowering us. So let us lift up thanks to him. Let us lift up praise to him for what he is doing. But let's also thank and praise him for what he will do because we know the scriptures say he is the faithful God and he is faithful to complete what he has started. So we give him all the praise and the glory this morning. I also want to say that we recognize that this is a difficult season for all of us, that all of us have had to deal with living in uh, self-isolation, social distancing, following all these guidelines and restrictions and just the frustration it may be. We recognize that some of you may have lost your job and the frustrations and the stress that having a financial burden now is weighing on your heart and your mind. Some of you having to be isolated are wrestling with bouts of depression and are struggling mentally and figuring out how am I just going to find the energy to get up out of bed, to get moving, to find something to be positive about. And so we recognize that there is pain and there's hurt there. Maybe for some of you, you think that as a parent, you're blowing it, that you just find yourself more frustrated as you're trying to uh, deal with your kids every day, trying to teach them, trying to get them to do their work and trying to find things to do. You might feel like, man, I'm just a failure. I'm not doing this right. And you feel overwhelmed. Or maybe there's some of you that are sitting back saying, man, I am trying to resist the temptation to give in to my addictions, but I am fighting it as hard as I can. I'm trusting, I'm praying, but it just seems like I'm going to give in, or maybe I have given in and I just don't know what else to do. Or maybe if you're a student, you're maybe struggling with your online courses and trying to keep up with all the work and trying to navigate this as you're trying to figure out, as you're separated from friends and trying to figure out life and what's the next step and what will school look like next year. And so we get it. You as students are even frustrated and ready for this season to be over. And we long for the days when we can just give a simple, warm embrace, a handshake, a hug, a fist bump, a high five without having to worry about catching a virus. We miss the days when things were normal. We miss those normal things of just going to the movies and hanging out with our friends. We miss that opportunity that we have to sit across from friends at restaurants and just laugh and enjoy each other's company and talk. We miss those moments of just going to a mall. For the ladies, we know you miss going to Target whenever you want to and just getting everything that you want to do. And so husbands, we know it's good for our bank account to have Target kind of at its side right now. But We miss those normal things that we used to do. Some of us miss going to amusement parks like Disney World and just hanging out with the family there and enjoying God's creation and the beauty that he has out there that we just can't. And for many of us, we miss worshiping with our church family, seeing our brothers and sisters in Christ and having that physical embrace where we just love on each other and we encourage each other in our faith. But what if, church, what if the things that we are missing are part of a lesson that God is teaching his church and God is teaching us in the world. I told Kelly this the other day, that it's like God has put the entire world in a time out. 
And I don't mean that God caused the virus. I'm just saying that it's like this moment where all of us are sitting in time out. And I have a picture that I want to show you here. And it's of a little girl who is sitting in time out. And this is literally what I feel like the world has, what has happened to the world, where God has said, okay, you guys are in time out. I need to refocus your priorities. I need you to focus on, you've been focusing on the wrong things for so long that he had to shake us up and show us what is most important in being a Christian and a follower of Jesus Christ. You see, we had focused on the very things that we were missing and made life about ourselves. We made it about our preferences. And God is saying, that is not what I've called the Christian life to be about. The Christian life is not lived just for your preferences, for your wants, for your desires. It is for living a life with a purpose. And I truly believe that God is teaching us his church about the power of now. He wants us to see that the time to live for him is now. The time to live out the gospel and for the gospel is now. The time to shine for Jesus is now. And God has been showing his church that the time is now for realize this important truth. And I put it in my notes this way. It can be in your notes if you're, if you're looking at the church app. It is this. It is about the mission, not about what we're missing. It is about the mission, not about what we're missing. So turn with me to Romans chapter 1. We're going to dive into verses 8 through 15 today. And so in today's text, we are going to see what a life looks like that is focused on the mission and not on what it is missing. And as we saw last week, the Apostle Paul was commissioned by Jesus himself to be a witness to the Gentiles. He was to bring them the good news. And so his whole mission was to take the good news as far as he could to the Gentile world to tell them about the good news. And he pens this letter to the Roman church 20, about 25 years after he received his commission from God. And so let's see what Paul has to say in verse 8. He says this, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. Right here in this verse, Paul is seeing that the plan that God had for his life is playing out right before his very eyes. Jesus said, you're going to the Gentiles. The good news is going to hit them and their lives are going to be changed. They're going to become a part of my family along with the Jewish Christians. We're all going to be one family in Christ and you're going to be my witness to bring it. And here already to this letter to the Romans, Paul is seeing that that is coming true. You see, we have to remember that Paul is a church planner, and he would go from city to city preaching the gospel, starting churches, establishing them, and planting these churches. But here in Rome, before he even gets to that church in Rome, there is a church there that is already growing and that is already flourishing. But not only has this church already been planted, Paul sees that he hears about their faith that it is a thriving church, one that is living out the gospel, one that is growing in their, fa- in their faith, even in the face of persecution. And what Paul was told by God, he sees that. Because somebody he told somewhere in some church heard the good news, received Christ as Lord and Savior, went and told somebody else, and that person shared the good news with somebody else, and somebody told it in Rome, and a church was founded because Paul was living out the mission. And God is showing Paul, look what I've called you to do. Look at what I'm doing. I am faithful to keep my promise. You will be a witness to the Gentiles. And he can see that there is people that are living on mission for Jesus the Messiah. Then we get to verse 9 where Paul says this, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you. He mentions the word serve here, and in the Greek it has the idea of priestly duties or worship. And if you remember priestly duties, the priests were the ones that served in the temple to worship God whose presence would dwell in the temple. So here Paul is saying that when he serves with his spirit, he's talking about his way of worshiping God. And he's worshiping God. He's worshiping the God of the gospel, the God of the good news. But Paul is also saying that the way that he lives his life in service to the Gentiles to deliver the good news, to do everything that to prioritize his life, 
life around the gospel and sharing it. He says, this is literally an act of worship to God by living my life as a sacrifice to sharing the good news in the gospel. And later in the book of Romans, Romans 12 verse 1, you can look at it later, but he says, look, we are to present ourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God, because this is our spiritual worship. So Paul is saying he worships Christ, not only just personally through prayer and through praising and through talking to him, but he also lives his life committed to the mission that God has given him as a way to worship the God of the gospel, Jesus, the Messiah. Paul truly exemplified a life that understood it is about the mission, not about what we're missing. And in this verse, he mentions the gospel, which is another way of saying good news. And we have to remind ourselves and just sit back and you're going to hear us talk about the gospel and what the gospel means all throughout this series because this is what the letter is about. The gospel that is moving forth in the world and changing lives. And so you're going to hear about it, but it's, it's all important for us to remember to keep it in the front of our minds. The good news does not mean how we get to heaven. The good news is not how we get saved. Going to heaven in God's space, going and getting a forgiveness of sins and being saved, that is a result of the good news being preached, declared, proclaimed, however you want to call it. When people hear the good news and respond in faith, yes, they will go to heaven. Yes, they will be saved. But the good news is way more than just that. And it's grounded in scripture and it's grounded in the Old Testament and it can be found in passages like Isaiah chapter 40. So if you have your Bible, you can turn back there. If you have the Bible app, you can go back and search for it. But it says this in Isaiah chapter 40 verses 9 through 11. Go up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not, Say to the cities of of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Isaiah 40, these verses we just read, speak of a time when the good news is announced. And what is the good news according to Isaiah? It is this, God has returned to his people Israel. He brings Israel out of exile. He establishes his kingdom on earth as in heaven. And God has become faithful to fulfill his promises through his Messiah, which we know as Jesus Christ. So the good news is about the Jewish Messiah, Jesus Christ. It's the God of Israel is the one true God of all the earth. All other gods are idols. Jesus of Nazareth was crucified, buried, and rose again from the dead and is now king of Israel, but he's also Lord of the entire cosmos. That's mean he's Lord of the entire earth. Israel's exile has come to an end. Our, our bondage to slavery and idols has been broken for the pagan nations. And because Jesus is the Messiah and King and Lord of the earth, this good news about him demands allegiance to him, demands obedience to him. And everyone who believes in Jesus the Messiah returns from exile, sin and death, becomes the family of God, becomes a new creation, and is set apart for the gospel, set apart for the good news. And this is the gospel, the good news that Paul has committed his whole entire life to. He is announcing this good news to a lost, hurt, and broken world. And as he announces the good news, guess what he sees? He sees God changing lives, saving souls. He sees people when they hear this good news about Jesus Christ, they are pledging their faith and allegiance in him and seeing them become the family of God. And this is the beauty of the gospel. This is the beauty of being set apart for it, is we have this good news that is life-changing, that can change someone's life and create them new, and we have an opportunity to share in God building this kingdom. 
Paul also demonstrates the importance of prayer in living a life on mission. You see, he realized that when he was going to spread the good news, it was going to do it, bathing it in prayer before he steps foot into a church. We see in verse 10, he says, he, always, he never ceases mentioning you so that he's always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. Paul understood the power of praying. He understood that he couldn't just pray once a day. He couldn't just make it a once a week thing. He prayed without ceasing. He prayed several times a day. He prayed before he went and visited a church. He prayed before he went and met with others. He prayed before he would open his mouth to preach the good news. And we church would learn to do well from this example. Before we speak with our neighbors, we should pray. Before we meet with someone just to have a conversation, we should pray for them. Before we share a testimony with someone, we should pray about God would give us the words to speak. Before we go into work, we should pray. We should bathe our whole life in prayer because the Apostle Paul, before going to see them, says, I always pray for you. I never stop ceasing. I'm seeing that you're faithful. I'm hearing you're faithful, and I'm praying for you in our lives as being committed to the mission should always be in prayer. Because when we pray, when we lift others up, we remind ourselves that it is about the mission, not about what we're missing. So let's continue reading. We're going to read verses 11 through 15 of Romans chapter 1. Paul goes on and says this, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. What's that? That is, that we may mutually encourage by each other's faith, both yours and in mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. I mentioned earlier that Paul is known for planting churches. So why is Paul longing so much to go to a church that has already been planted and already started and is growing and is flourishing and he's heard about it without even beginning it? Why would he want to go to this church? We see in verses 11 through 12 that the church is not lacking anything in their faith. They're not lacking God's spirit at work in them. They're growing. They're faithful. They're not lacking in a spiritual gift. Paul mentions that he wants to impart a spiritual gift, but then in verse 12, he tells us what that gift is, and it's, hey, we're going to encourage each other in our faith. I'm going to come and visit you, and I'm going to talk about what God's done in me and what, what I've seen God do in the world, and I'm gonna, you're going to share your faith, and you're going to tell me your testimony, and it's going to encourage one another. And so when he mentions a spiritual gift, they're not lacking in a spiritual gift. The gift is literally encouraging one another in their faith, the same way that we encourage one another when we talk about our faith. Then we see in verse 13 that Paul's passion is on display and his desire is on display to get to this church in Rome. Why was Paul so passionate about visiting the church in Rome? Why was he willing to persevere even though he was hindered several times beforehand? What is it about him and why is he so concerned about getting to this church in Rome? The crux of it all is found in verses 14 and 15. I'll read it again. It says, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Jesus gave Paul a mission, and he was to be a witness to the Gentiles. And Paul mentions that he is under this obligation, and the meaning of obligation is he is indebted to this mission. He is indebted to the good news. In other words, Paul is indebted to the Greeks and the barbarians. I'll give you an illustration. Um, Indebted has the idea of this. If I were to give my wife, Kelly, $100, and I say, here's a $100 bill, I want you to take this $100 bill, and I want you to give it to Pastor Brian. That $100 bill belongs to Brian, not to you, Kelly. It's not for you to get your nails done or go to Target. It's for Pastor Brian. In this moment, Kelly is indebted to me because I gave her the money. 
It was my money that I gave to her, so she's indebted to me to make sure she completes the task, but she's also indebted to Pastor Brian because the $100 is truly belongs to him. She has to give it to him. In the same way, Jesus gave Paul the good news to the Gentiles and the barbarians. Paul is indebted to Jesus because Jesus gave him the good news, the mission to do, but he's also indebted to the Gentiles and to the barbarians because the good news belongs to them. And for him to hold it back is to hold back something that belongs to the Gentiles and the barbarians. So when he goes to Rome, he's going there because God has called him to be a light to the Gentiles. And yes, there's Christians that are there, but all of Rome is not saved. And the opportunity for him to go and visit with this church, but also to share the gospel, could see other lives come to go and give their life in faith. And you see later in the book of Romans that Paul is going to go on from the church in Rome. His desire is to go to Spain and bring the good news to the Gentile world. He was indebted to this gospel and he understood this good news is not something he sits on. This good news doesn't just belong to him so his life has changed. This good news is not just for him to make sure him and his family are going to heaven. This good news was given to him for him to give it to those who it belongs to and it belongs to the nations who haven't heard the good news and given their life to him. He prioritized his life to the mission, not about what he's missing. Church, we do not have the exact same call as Paul. He was called to the Gentiles specifically, but each of us have been commissioned by Jesus himself when he told his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. And how do we do that? It's by sharing the good news with others. We are ourselves, every believer is indebted to the gospel and sharing the good news to those around us. It's not an option. It's not a good idea. It is a mission. We have been commissioned. We have been set apart for the gospel, and it is to share that good news with others. And Jesus is teaching us during this time of crisis that the time is now for the church to live on mission. We have been given the good news, and we are entrusted to share that good news We owe it to those outside of the kingdom of God. It's their good news. The good news belongs to them. So church, as we close this morning, we have to remember that the time is now to put aside our selfish preferences. The time is now for us to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. The time is now to stop complaining about what we are missing and start living for the mission. The time is now to build relationships with our neighbors. The time is now to start helping those in need. The time is now to stand up for those who are being marginalized. The time is now to embrace people of all ethnic backgrounds. The time is now to honor others above yourselves. The time is now to sacrifice your wants and desires to serve others. The time is now for you to decrease and for Christ to increase. The time is now for you to share your testimony of what Jesus has done in your life. The time is now to stand against racism. The time is now to live your life in worship of Christ and of his gospel and the good news. It is the power of now that matters and we church have to embrace the mission. God has given us a reset. He's given us a refocus and says, this is what has been important the whole entire time. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is what we've been called to do. And church, now is the time to do it because there are people struggling, hurting, losing hope, And we have an opportunity to give them the greatest hope ever that with the good news, when we proclaim it to them, there is life, forgiveness of sins, freedom from sin, idolatry, and death. And it's found in Jesus Christ. And we have that good news. And let's share it because it truly belongs to them. So two things. Will you join me in committing to the good news? And secondly, will you pray every day with me? God, remind me that it is about the mission, not about what I'm missing. Church, if we pray that prayer and we begin to live on mission, 
we can sit back on the other side of this one day and say, wow, look at what God did when his church mobilized, when his church took him at his word and proclaimed his good news with unashamed abandon and took the good news to the people it really belonged to and really lived as his church. We're, we will see a miraculous work, but we have to live on mission. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I also want to give an opportunity for those that may be watching that have never given your life to Christ. The good news is that here Jesus is standing before you, Jesus the Messiah, ready to offer you new life, new creation, forgiveness of sins, ready to enter you and call you one of his children to become the family of God. And in order for us to do that, it's us saying, I believe that Jesus is King and Lord, that God, that he was crucified, buried, and rose again from the dead. And anybody who believes in him and puts their faith in Christ, the scriptures say they will be saved. And God will change you. God will come in and put you right. He'll restore you to your original purpose and you will become a part of what God is doing in the world. And God is showing us every time the good news goes forth, lives are changed. And we are in a moment of life right now where God is shouting at us, hey, pay attention, look at what I'm doing. My good news is out there. My gospel is changing lives and you don't want to miss it. You wanna be on board with it. His kingdom is here. And yes, we don't have it fully, but he's saying, I want you to be a part of it. I want you in my family, but if you don't believe in Jesus as the Messiah, you're going to miss it. So to jump on board with what God is doing, place your faith in Jesus Christ today. Join with me in prayer. Father God in heaven, we thank you that you have been faithful to fulfill your promises in our life. Jesus, we thank you that when the Father gave you the mission to seek and save the lost, that you went all out for it. You lived completely to do that. Father, we didn't earn it. Father, we don't deserve it. Father, you know the times that we shook our fist in your face, yet Jesus came and lived that mission so that we could be purchased from sin and death and be set free to know your love, to be loved by you, and to know you, Father God, and to be known by you. Father, I pray that each of us that are believers, our brothers and sisters in Christ, that we would realize that now is the time to share the good news. Now is the time to share the testimony of what you're doing in the world and what you can do in people's lives. Father, I pray that you give us boldness as lions, that you fill us with courage, that your spirit empowers us and equips us for this mission, Father God, and that we would no longer live lives that are about ourselves, that are about our selfish desires, but we would live fully a life of worship which is indebted to the gospel, the good news, and we would share it to those around us. Lord, we love you. We praise you. It's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen.
from danger Interposed his precious blood oh, 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 to grace to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace now, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. darkest valleys of life when it seems like just raging seas are overtaking us in life. God, I pray we would remember that you are with us always in the midst of those valleys in the harshest, harshest conditions. You are with us always, Father, even when it seems like you are the furthest. Your, your word promises us that. So God, I pray that we would just remember your truths. We would meditate on your word. We would trust in you, trust in the Holy Spirit you've given us so freely. God, I pray that we just continue to run to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. Be blessed. Have an amazing Sunday. We pray that um, you just seek the Lord throughout this week and that you remember that he is with you always. So we love you. It's in Christ's name we all pray. It's in Christ's name we worship. It's in Christ's name that everything we do for Jesus, because of Jesus, always will be because of Jesus. So thank you, and uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>